Good evening, everyone. We're really happy that you're here. You're brave enough to come out and join us for the evening. And um, so this is our first talk for 2020. And we want to thank the Housatonic Valley Regional High School for hosting us. Um, they'll be hosting a number of our talks this year. And uh, also, of course, uh, thank the Salisbury School and Hotchkiss School for their generous donations that help support us. And all of you who have sent us donations, uh, we couldn't do these free talks without your support. So thank you very much. And if you wish, um, there are some donation envelopes in the lobby if you have not donated um, and you like our talks and want to help us. So we have some terrific speakers lined up this year, uh, especially this spring. Jerry Sauls will be with us on April 3rd. And he's the longtime art critic for New York Magazine. He is um, often irreverent and quite funny. He's very knowledgeable, and I don't think you want to miss that talk. The title of his talk is, What is Art Today? The Good, the Bad, and the Very Bad. <laughs> so you can get a little bit of a sense of his sense of humor by that. Kurt Anderson will be speaking for us on May 15th. He has written for film, television, and the stage. He's the host and co-creator of Public Radio Studio 360, which is a podcast that focuses on arts and culture. He is also you know, just a long-term journalist, uh, very articulate. He is an author of a bestseller called Fantasyland, How America Went Haywire, A 500-Year History. And uh, it's a fascinating book, and I think he's coming out with a sequel to that um, sometime soon. We're very fortunate to have Wendy Schiller here with us this evening. She is a professor of political science, professor of international and public affairs, and chair of the political science department at Brown University. She's written about and taught classes at, um, about the presidency, Congress, and the Senate, the 17th Amendment, and women in elected office. And she has some fascinating insights into how women um, can succeed and things they shouldn't be doing if they want to succeed in both in elected office, and then also a lot of it pertains to business in general. So given that this election year may be the most dramatic and important um, election of our lifetimes, insight into the election process is, and how it has changed and what we might expect could not be more timely. So I hope you will join me in welcoming Wendy Schiller to us this evening. Okay, welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. Appreciate that. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. So I am originally from uh, New York, Long Island, so I speak pretty quickly. But I'm going to try to keep it at a nice cadence where I don't speed up. But if I do speed up and you think I'm speaking too quickly, just shout out, slow down. I won't be in the least bit offended. And when I give talks, I give talks fairly... Uh, around the country, the only city that ever did that to me was Atlanta. <laughs> and I thought that was funny because they're so genteel in the South, but they were, you know, really yelling at me to be quiet. Not be quiet, be slow down. So I will try not, not to speak too quickly. Here's the sort of frame of the talk, which I, I hope that you will take with you and think about as you navigate the next, um, I think it's exactly since last Tuesday, I think it's eight months till the election, and that is what, what are the components of our electoral system that are baked in? Meaning, what has really been the same since our country was founded, just in different iterations over time, and what's new? And what don't you like about this system that could be changed, potentially? Rather than saying nothing will ever change, nothing will ever change, there are some things that I think we can change, and there are some things that I think we can't, that are baked in. And trying to spend all of your energy changing things that are baked in is probably not the best use of time, certainly to get through this election. Uh, so I'm going to try to give you some guideposts on that. And uh, I normally don't cast a shadow on a screen, uh, but I might be casting a shadow, so I'll try to walk around a little bit. OK, so what I want to do is flip through. I have a lot of slides. I will not get through them, I promise you. So we're going to make them available through the Salisbury Forum so you can get the whole package with the sources and all the data that I present. And uh, I'm opening uh, up to any kind of questions at all uh, at the end of the talk. 
not, not in the talk. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I have lots of pretty charts and graphs, but let's start with this thing. When we talk about baked in, uh, some of you may have read this quote. I know that there's some history teachers and students in the, in the audience, and they probably have. This is from George Washington's Farewell Address, 1796, uh, actually written by Har um, Alexander Hamilton, but largely edited. Did a lot of rewrites, George Washington. So it's a joint effort. I'm just going to start in the middle of the quote because I've already violated PowerPoint by putting so many words on a slide. But I want to read you what George Washington said about parties. Uh, party agitates the, com the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection, a fire not to be quenched. It demands a uniform vigilance to prevent its bursting into a flame, lest instead of warming, it should consume. This is 1796. He's leaving. His only real experience with partisanship and polarization is having dinner with Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton at the same time. <laughs> That's like having dinner with Mitch McConnell and Charles Schumer, Chuck Schumer at the same time. He basically believed that the country was incredibly fragile. We were a grand experiment. Let's not forget that. There had never been a self-government before, ever. There was the Magna Carta, there were controls, there was Oliver Cromwell in England, but nonetheless, there was never anything like the experiment that, the, that had been created to form the United States of America. And he had the unenviable task of being the first president of this very fragile nation, a nation that was divided by region, by religion, by native tongue, actually, by currency, by economic infrastructure, and philosophical approach to politics, not to mention slavery. This was a nation fundamentally divided, fragmented, with very little in common. We have to remember that's the beginning of who we are. That we are divided today and polarized, and I will talk about a little bit about that, is not any surprise at all. It has to do with the, the actual birth of the nation in the sense of the decision to split from England um, at, or not was our first dichotomous choice, yes or no. No gray area, no gray area. They tried to negotiate some gray area, the British wouldn't bite, so they abandoned it. The point is, there was no gray area. So we start with that, and then we impose upon it that dichotomy that existed when we actually ratify the Constitution, we have a yes or no. Are you ratifying the Constitution or not? Rhode Island has the proud history of being the last state colony to ratify the Constitution. After nine of them did it, nine out of 13, didn't matter what Rhode Island did, um, but they eventually did it. Why is that so important? Because they adopted a political electoral system, an electoral system that reinforces this dichotomy. We have a single member, I discussed this at dinner, a single member plurality district, meaning the House of Representatives, you have one person for one geographic district, and you can win that seat with a plurality, which means it's essentially two people compete for that seat. A third person trying to compete for that seat can never get enough, and people begin to think, I'm not wasting my vote on a third party. The person will never win. It's got to be one of the two major parties. It's a self-reinforcing electoral system that yields two choices. Pro-slavery, anti-slavery, go into World War I, don't do it, but, you know, do the Versailles Treaty, don't do it. World War II, Vietnam, civil rights, we have abortion. Every issue you can think of in America is typically not mediated by lots of different voices, but typically proposed and divided into two choices. And that's what's handed to the voter. It's handed to you by political parties, and it's handed to you by the media. When we think about the media, there has been partisan, slanted media in America since the beginning, the very beginning. There's nothing new about it whatsoever. In fact, if you look at the history of media, if some of you have been involved in the, in the media industry, the most of our country's history has had slanted media. The only time it was even remotely objective starts to be in the 1930s and goes all the way to the 1990s. And why? 
because you had the invention of radio, and radio became a mass communication tool. And because radio was live, newspapers couldn't really slant anything that was happening at the moment. This, this gets very much the case in World War II coverage. And then live television. You can't really dispute if something is right in front of your face live. So the ability for the, the media to filter and put a, a partisan slant on things actually diminishes in that period of time. And then with the advent of cable, which is not under any restrictions, you see the resurgence of partisan media. Not the invention of partisan media, the resurgence of partisan media. So the, the story I tell about this is of Alexander Hamilton, who bought the Westchester Post Gazette. And how do I know that? I know that because when I was right out of college, I had the very good fortune of working for someone named Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was a senator from New York State for some time. And he was writing a big speech. And he remembered that Al Hamilton had bought a paper to print the Federalist Papers in to persuade people to adopt the Constitution. So he said to the uh, legislative director, find me the paper Hamilton bought. And the legislative director said, I'm not finding the paper that Hamilton bought, but I will get this junior person we just hired to do it. So I did it, and there was a great uh, newspaper project at the University of Wisconsin in Madison that had old newspapers. Turns out to be the Westchester Post-Gazette. He bought it, a rich guy bought a newspaper to influence public opinion. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? So Alexander Hamilton and Rupert Murdoch would be have perfectly happy at a table together, sitting down, talking about how you can manipulate the media. And you know who would join the conversation? Jeff Bezos. Because Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post. And liberals are all hunky-dory comfortable with that, because he tends to be liberal, and there's a lot of investigations done by the Post, Washington Post. Don't get so comfortable with that. You know, if you're not gonna like a conservative rich guy owning the media to shape public opinion, I don't think you get to like the liberal rich guy who owns media to shape public opinion. The point of the story is, it's been around forever. Americans are subject to it, and we think about it, and we, we, we lament it. And you know who makes us lament it? The media. So then we wanna click on that column in the New York Times website that laments the influence of the media. And so the New York Times makes money off that. The two forces in American politics that make money or, or are successful at feeding division are political parties whose very lives depend on distinguishing themselves from each other and winning elections, and the media that needs us to click and click and watch and watch. So when you wanna just take a step back and say, is it all really that bad? Part of you say, well, maybe it is that bad. But you can console yourself with the idea that it's not very new, and that the country has been through these periods before, they've been subject to this manipulation, and come out of the, um, them, not always on the better side, but most of the time. Okay, so let's look at what this division looks like. This is what the division looks like, 2016. Uh, going into 2020, when we think about elections, there are fundamentals about elections. What gets people to go out the door and vote has not really changed. That they are able to vote in many circumstances by mail, for example, or for two weeks at a time is something relatively new. There's also attempts to suppress people's ability to vote by purging them from the rolls. So there's all sorts of issues that go with our voting system. But if you look at what Donald Trump won by, uh, and I'll give you the data later, 138 million votes cast, and he won by fewer than 100,000 votes. And here's what the map looked like. So the blue is Democrat, the red is Republican, as you may uh, already know. So you've got uh, the East, basically the East Coast and the West Coast, and then everything else is red. And I'm gonna talk a little bit as we get further into the talk and in the Q&A about what I see changing about this map, but here's the deep problem with this map, whether you're on the Republican side or the Democratic side, the deep problem is when a president who's a Democrat, let's say, wins with this kind of geographic majority, all of the states that are red, those governors, if they're Republican governors, most of the time they are, don't have to agree with, obey, or cooperate with the Democrat who won the presidency because that Democrat didn't win their states. 
and unless they're super competitive and close, and I'll show you the list of those states, that means for public policy, it's increasingly more difficult to get unified public policy, even at the federal level, because the states don't, don't go along. And it's true of a Republican president with Democratic states. We see President Trump having fights with New York, having fights with California. We saw this with Obama, uh, Texas in particular, fighting with Obama. This is something, this is something a little bit more new. As these states become deeper on one side or the other of the political spectrum, it gets harder to govern. Not because they can't compromise, but because there's no electoral incentive for the state governments to cooperate with an opposite party president. And that's why it was somewhat refreshing to see uh, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington State, who was running for president a while back, dropped out a while ago, with Mike Pence at a press conference to say, we're trying to work together on the coronavirus. I mean, it's really, really important. But structurally, this really creates so many problems. We know that uh, with um, the ACA, Obamacare, there was opposition to that. There were 26 states attorney generals that filed suit. We know that went to the Supreme Court. Those are the attorney generals of the states that Obama lost. So unless we figure out a way to make states more competitive, and I have an idea for that at the end of the talk, we are going to face increasing challenges in getting any kind of progress at the federal government level on things that you may believe the federal government should do. Because even if they pass the federal government, implementation at the local level is a, a considerable challenge. OK, this is just really uh, relatively quickly, I hope, <laughs> that uh, nothing matters about today, meaning that presidents have had approval ratings that have been higher and lower in the early months of their election year, and they've won or lost, and there's no correlation between their approval rating now and whether they win or lose, at least going all the way back to um, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, key swing states on elections, this is another um, issue. There are still some states that persist in being more what we call balanced or competitive. So we look down and we see what the margins were, and we can see that when Trump won, he didn't win by a big percentage in many states, except for, um, let's see, um, our, which one? Oh, yeah, Iowa. Iowa, he won a lot. So how could we actually change those margins? Words, how could we make more states look like these states? Why is it that there are so many, you know, so few swing states? My proposal to you would be that we could change the Electoral College. But we can't change the Constitution. And the Electoral College is built into the Constitution. Can't open that up. That's not a good thing to do. The founders made it difficult to amend the Constitution. There aren't that many amendments post the first 10. There's a reason for that. And some of them are double, like prohibition. You invoke prohibition and then you repeal prohibition. Those are two different amendments. So we don't want to do that. But what we can do that most people don't think about is that the state legislatures can divide the Electoral College delegates any way they want. I have my constitution with me. The states shall apportion them. So every state legislature could adopt proportional representation of the, of the Electoral College delegates. So for every percentage that Trump gets in New York, 35, 40%, 50%, well, probably not 50%, but 40%, you would get those delegates and the other 60% would go to the Democrat. Why is that so essential? Why would that be important? Because that makes every state competitive. It makes every state worth voting in. It means that my vote won't not count because I'm in a red state or a blue state. People will get out the door. Voting rates will go up. Turnout, everything will go up, and presidential candidates will have to actually come up with policies that benefit more of the country. It can't be as targeted to the large states, for example, or the swing states. And so I think that is, a, is doable. It's doable now. You could get your state legislature to do it now. Well, I don't know if you could personally, but you could try. And these are the kinds of things we have to be thinking about in American politics now. Not just lamenting and not just saying, get rid of it. It's not fair. You have to work within the framework that we have. And this is one thing that could be done. I think if Texas looks really competitive this year, if the Republicans lose Texas, unlikely but possible, if they lose Texas, they are going to start to say, hey, maybe we should start doing proportional representation in some of these states because we are losing our competitive advantage. Because their advantage, if you remember that map I just showed, are in low population states for the most part and medium population states. 
The problem with the theory is that California won't do it. The Democrats who run California will never give up that kind of electoral college prize unless they're pressured to. But every state can do it. Nebraska does it, Maine does it. They don't seem to swing the election, although these days elections are so tight that they could. And the point is any state could do it. And we should insist on that, I think, as voters. The other thing to think about the map for 2020 and elections is that there are gains being made by the Democrats that are shifting the context of the Electoral College map. Typically, we think of Democratic strength in the East and the Midwest. Trump won some of those states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, in 2016. Democrats, in the meantime, have been picking up or making progress in places like Kansas. And Kansas is a tradition of, you know your history, Alf Landon ran for president twice from Kansas, Nancy Kassebaum, uh, came, Nancy Landon Kassadon was a senator from Kansas, came from that, was, her, was Alf Landon's daughter. Bob Dole came from Kansas, very Republican state. But they elected a Democratic woman as governor in 2018, Laura Kelly. And they have an open seat, and it looks like a Republican woman is now going to run as a Democrat, Barbara Bali is her name, and then Chris Kobach, who was the czar of voting behavior under Trump, he ran for governor, 2018 he lost, he's going to run for Senate. Point is, Democrats could win Kansas. They could win Kansas seat, Senate seat, and they could win Kansas outright. And in Arizona, there's a highly contested Senate seat coming up, and it's turning more blue. They just elected their first female Democratic senator in 2018. So if you think about it, that shifts the Electoral College map for the Democrats away from the Rust Belt and more further towards the West. You'd have Washington State, Oregon, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, and California and then sw sweeping into Kansas, possibly. What does that mean? It means the definition of the, Repub of the Democratic Party changes. It means that the policies the Democratic Party pursues changes. It enhances the power of Latinos in the Democratic Party, maybe above and uh, over African Americans. This should be in your head if you're thinking about vice presidential choices. So it's shifting. Arizona has 11 electoral college delegates. Wisconsin has 10. So if Democrats lose Wisconsin but pick up Arizona, it's fine. It's a trade-off. So that's really important going ahead, looking at the sort of geography interacted with the Electoral College, plus trends in people's mobility, their attitudes, and demographics. OK, very quickly, you can pick these up um, on the slide deck. But this is important to know as we go further in time. 2016, the lowest point of non-Hispanic white voter turnout share. This will go down again in 2020. So what we're looking at is a decreasing, the whites still make up you know, the vast majority of the vote share, but it's going down every two years. And so that has, and that is not going down uh, uniformly across states, as I just said. It empowers particular groups in particular states that are not white. But here's the turnout by white, black, Hispanic, and other. And you can see that white is, is, was the highest turnout, but you get to 2008, and African-American turnout starts to equal white turnout. And this is why it's been so crucial, for example, this past week for Joe Biden in the Democratic primary, that African-American turnout was so high and mostly in his corner. So African-Americans are reliable voters. They get out the door, particularly African-American women. 70% turnout among registered African-American women. It's the highest demographic turnout among all of our subgroups. Uh, Hispanics or Latinos have a relatively low voting turnout, particularly compared to whites and blacks, just under 50%, about 47.5%. And that hasn't changed much. If you look at this graph, it just doesn't really change. They, you know, they kind of go up and down. These are midterm versus presidential elections. And they basically never really crack 50%. Nobody can win the presidency with a Latino vote. Nobody. And why? Uh, first of all, it's not high enough, just like the youth vote. No offense to the youth in the audience. But anybody between 18 and 30, those voting turnout rates are 48%. A little bit higher in Obama's first campaign, but generally less than 50% of people between those age groups vote. This is what cost Bernie Sanders a lot of those states this past Tuesday. You can't win an election with millennials. Or maybe millennials between 30 and 40, 
but you can't really, you can't win with them. They don't get out the door. And you wonder why, and there are some barriers to voting for young people, but generally they're good at going to marches, they're good at boycotting, they're good at social media, not so good at showing up and actually voting on election day. Um, and I'll show you the pure numbers there. Here we go. Uh, the purple line is 60 plus. Look at the turnout rate in presidential elections for people over the age of 60. <laughs> Nearly 70% of people over the age of 60 vote. This is why young people will never defeat old people on policy. Now, because you look at the 18 to 29 as the blue line, and you see it just never gets as high. But what's, it, it, there's a cohort effect. As you get older, you have more stake in policy. You, you're affected by much more government policy. You pay taxes, maybe you make some more money, you pay more taxes. You get much more vested in, in policy, so you get out the door. But this empowers states disproportionately like Florida. Florida has a very large, um, not very large, but a decent percentage of people over the age of 60. So does Arizona. And so you'll have, now you'll see some competition in these age groups. For example, Bernie Sanders' policy on Medicare for all. Now, who do you think, what isn't so crazy about that idea? Young people love it. You know who doesn't like it? People on Medicare. Why? Because they recognize, they've seen a lot of government policy over time, they recognize that if you give Medicare for all, you will undoubtedly dilute Medicare for people over the age of 65. You'll have to do that. You can't pay for everything. So the services you might have, even though Medicare premiums, according to my mother, are still pretty high, and you need Advantage plans to supplement it, uh, the point is that there wasn't, not only was there not enough turnout among young people, there's not enough support among the people who vote in the largest numbers for the policy he's trying to sell. And to me, that just, it's an interesting way of trying to run a campaign, but you've got to sell the product. And, and that's, this, is, this is one of the reasons why it's, it's so lethal, it was sort of lethal for Elizabeth Warren, but it, and it might be the thing that denies Bernie Sanders the nomination. It's not just that young people didn't turn out, it's that the people who are old enough, who know what Medicare is, aren't so excited about making it a program for everybody. Okay, citizen voting age turnout by education. We have, obviously, you think about it, postgraduate people, they vote in the largest numbers. People highly educated vote really very predictably. People who are lowest educated don't vote as, um, they don't turn out in the biggest numbers. But Trump understood that because they don't turn out in big numbers, they might have been discounted by the Democrats. So he managed to get those people out the door in slightly bigger numbers in 2016. But you know, not even so much, right? So 2012, it's slightly higher than 2016, but he got them out the door in states where it mattered. 60% of America does not go to college. 60%. And that's where this number becomes so important in swinging elections. Yes, the turnout rate is much lower among people with less than high school education or high school education, but there are a lot more of them. So if you swing them as a whole demographic, you can win states, and that's what Trump did. 40% of people in America have some college between the ages of, of 18 and 30. Some college, but not even four years. It's about 27, 28% of America has four years of college. It's not a huge number. That's the other thing. You're running a national campaign. 60% of people don't go to college. You're not suggesting vocational training or mandated uh, training and funded training for the ages of 18 and 21 for people who may not want to go to college. That would be a good idea. Uh, no, instead you're saying you're gonna forgive student loans for the 40% of people who went to college, which does nothing for the 60% of people who don't go to college. So you have to, in your head, you have to sort of break down the sort of reactions that people have based on how they live how they're educated, where they live, where their communities are, what they do for a living. And think, think deeply about how that plays out across the country. This is polarization. This is a, how, what percentage of the one side votes against what percentage of the other side. I just want to quickly point out, in 1879 and 2015, the gap looks pretty much the same. Right? We were just as polarized in the second part of the 19th century, post-Reconstruction. However, 
The scope of the federal government is so much larger that the damage of polarization is much more extensive. The government had, uh, the, the budget, and I'm, I'm not making this number up, the budget in the 1890s was $250 million, federal budget, that's it. It didn't rise to $780 million till the end of the 1920s. The government didn't do anything. It built roads, it built post office at the Army Corps of Engineers, generally tried to avoid war here and there, didn't do anything. So it maybe it didn't matter so much. This is about slavery, Jim Crow, and trade. That's what these gaps are in, from 1879 all the way to 1935 when the New Deal comes in. Then we expand our conflict to social policy, Medicare entitlement programs, and, and civil rights. So keep in mind, again, polarization's always been around, but the impact is so much greater today because the size of the federal government with a projected $4.4 trillion budget, that's your tax dollars at work this year, um, is just makes it, makes you feel it much more than you would have 100 years ago. And um, another significant difference from 100 years ago is most people were not literate. Most people were not educated. The North had better high school graduation rates than the South by a long shot. So people relied on their churches, their workplace, their families. Women couldn't vote anyway. So there was a much sort of big, much tighter funnel of information about politics. Political parties um, would sort of tell people how to vote and say, oh, we'll give you a job if you vote this way, the patronage system. But not everybody believed that their opinion was worth saying because they weren't educated. They thought, we'll just go along with the crowd. We, we don't need to know everything. Now, everybody has an opinion. And everybody's opinion is really, really important and well-formed because you can all look it up on your phone. And what does that do? It makes everybody an expert, and everybody's opinion has to be shared, and everybody's opinion has to be taken seriously, and everybody thinks they know what's going on, which makes it harder to have community facts, right? Harder to have objectivity, objective news, when everybody thinks that they can tell you what the answer is, because everybody's checking Google. Google's the great unifier of American politics today. Why is this so important? It's important because people are making voting decisions based on the information that they are processing, but they sometimes don't have enough policy knowledge to understand the consequences of what they're being told, yet they feel confident enough not to ask somebody who might know, not to take a cue from somebody else, but to make the decision themselves, and then only talk to people who they agree with to reinforce that decision. That's, that's a significant problem. Because when you had to go to a community place, a tavern, a church, wherever you were going to discuss politics, you were in a public place. You had to behave in a civilized manner. You had to engage in debate and conversation. Now that we have the weapon of, of social media communication, you don't have to live by those rules anymore. And that is fraying at our social interactions. That is sort of saying to people, I can be mean and nasty, all the things Hobbes worried about, Thomas Hobbes, when people can let loose with no consequences. I know this for a fact as a, as a department chair in a college. People will write things in email that they will not say to your face, frequently. And you have to say to them, could you read that email you just sent me? And just ask yourself if you, you should have sent that email. Or I say, hey, let's have a conversation in person. You know, you're upset, you have a problem. Let's just sit down and talk about it, just face to face. You know, and then I, I hear nothing. It's like crickets, nothing. They never come back. Because people don't engage, and that's the problem. Because it's much easier to demonize the other when you no longer interact with people on a one-to-one -one human basis. And that's the scary part of democracies. The capacity for a particular faction to demonize other people because they are different. And when people aren't interacting with those people, it becomes a much more um, uh, manipulated, uh, it's easier to manipulate people's sense of things. Look at people have, behave on a plane most of the time, if they're not on a YouTube video. But if they, are, they behave, you sit down and say, you don't ask somebody what their religion and political affiliation is when you sit down next to them, next to them on the plane. 
You just hope they're not, you know, sick, obviously, and not making a joke about that, but you hope they're quiet, whatever, and you say maybe pick up a conversation. Where are you going? Are you going on vacation? I mean, how many people ever sit down and grill somebody about politics on a plane? Nobody. Well, sometimes they grill me when they find out what I do for a living, but that's just me. <laughs> Seriously, it, the, the capacity for people to get along is far greater than the capacity to hate each other. But you have to work at it. And if you don't have messages in the parties and the government and the media encouraging you to do that, then I think we do run into some structural problems in our democracy that are much harder to confront. Okay, I'm just gonna make fun of Congress before I get into the 2018 and 2020 elections, so I don't have that much more time. So, presidents hate Congress. Every president hates Congress. No exception, starting with the first one. For heaven's sake, who are Congress? Are they not the creatures of the people, amenable to them for their conduct and dependent from day to day on their breath? 1783, it was just the Continental Congress. It wasn't even the permanent Congress. They weren't paying his revolutionary soldiers and he was furious. And so he, was, he hated them before he ever became president and it didn't change. And then Thomas Jefferson in 1820, basically this quote is a long-winded way of saying Congress spends too much money and they're not accountable. And this is Thomas Jefferson, who spent a lot of money as president, by the way. So he seems to have um, selective memory problems there. So when we think about why people don't like Congress, it starts at the very beginning. It's hard to like a chamber that has tough, a tough time getting things done. So this is what Benjamin Franklin said about bicameralism, and it's worth remembering. Bicameralism is having two chambers of a legislative body. Has not the famous political fable of the snake with two heads and one body some useful instruction she was going to a brook to drink, and in her way was to pass through a hedge, a twig of which opposed her direct course. One head chose to go on the first right side of the twig, the other on the left, so that time was spent in the context, and before the decision was completed, the poor snake died with thirst. 1789, he was angry because Pennsylvania had gone from a unicameral legislature to a bicameral legislature when it came into the, when it came into the union. So he was very unhappy about that because he said you can't get anything done with two chambers. And especially if they're controlled by opposite parties. Uh, the book I wrote, um, uh, just to make you feel better, this is from 1883. It's a political cartoon. It's Uncle Sam looking very sad. And what's he sad about is that in those days, senators were selected in state legislatures, not directly elected. That didn't happen until 1913. And state legislators would fight like crazy over who would go to the Senate. And sometimes they would deadlock. They would literally, like this fighting that's going on in New York and Colorado, in Kentucky they pulled guns and knives when they were trying to figure it out. They would have to vote at the same time in separate chambers um, in the beginning of the year. And if they didn't get a majority candidate that won in both chambers, they'd have to get together and vote every single day till they could pick a winner. And many states deadlocked. They just said, forget it, we've been voting for 40 days, we're tired, we're going home. We don't really need a senator, the government doesn't do anything anyway. That would be Delaware deadlocked three times. No senators because of it. Look how unhappy Uncle Sam is. That was in the 1880s. And so what did we do? We adopted the 17th Amendment. And you know what that was gonna do? That was gonna give Senate elections directly to the people. The people were gonna elect senators. And that was gonna get rid of corruption and bribery because rich people bribed state legislators to pick their favorite senator. And that was gonna make the Senate more responsive. And Senate campaigns were gonna be much less expensive and there was gonna be a much wider circle of people who served in the Senate. That's what a constitutional amendment promised to do. There's a punchline coming here. This is a chart of who won for Senate from 1871 to 1913, okay? So when you look at this, this is including incumbents. 43% of senators were incumbents who won re-election, incumbency advantage, and 15% came from the House, the other came from state elected, and uh, other kinds of political organizations. Today, 53%, um, there's a re-election re rate of 84% of senators, and then 53% of senators come from the House of Representatives, or their governors, or their attorney generals. There's virtually no difference in the source distribution of who becomes a senator today than there was 100 years ago before the adoption 
of uh, 120 years ago before the 17th Amendment, except for diversity. But that's it. And then, just want to point out one thing. All Senate candidates in 2018 spent $1 billion. That's just the Senate candidates. It's not outside money. A billion dollars. You know what they spent? $426 million in 2018 dollars in 1899. So what does that tell you? And there were, there were many fewer contests. There were about um, 16 to 18 senators elected in a given year in those days. What it tells you is that the 17th Amendment has not made the Senate more responsive, has not made it more diverse, has not reduced the role of money, did nothing to enhance democracy. I have five minutes left, I better cruise. Don't buy what people sell you. The only way to change a democracy is to do it individually and collectively in terms of protest marching, in voting, in trying to change the people in office and build support at the state level and the national level. An institutional rules change will not make our country a better or more responsive democracy. We have to follow up on that ourselves. Okay, I'm gonna go to what happened in 2018? Record turnout in 2018. 118 million voters, 50.3% turnout in 2018. In 2014, 36.5% turnout, right? Is that what I have? Yeah, 36.7% um, turnout. It's a huge difference, 2018 versus 2014. You know what's true about that? Everybody who voted in a federal election in 2018 is currently registered to vote. You can't purge somebody who voted in the most recent federal election. So all the purges you saw that were happening in 2018, 2016, much harder to do with so many more people voting in 2018. They know where their polling place is, they know how to register, and they can't be purged. That makes a difference in thinking about turnout for 2020. Also, there's a record number of female U.S. senators. There's actually 26. That number should be updated with Kelly Loeffler being appointed. 26 U.S. senators. When I was in Washington in 1987, there were two. Two female senators. Maybe it took too long, but it's uh, certainly a big, a big difference. And in the House of Representatives, there were 23 women when Nancy Pelosi was elected to the House for the first time in 1987. 23 women. There are 100 and nine women in the House of Representatives today. So there has really been you know, a tremendous amount of change. So I'm just gonna leave, uh, finish actually at this and then open up for questions. Um, I want us to think a little bit deeply, not a little bit, a lot. Does the 116th Congress look like America? Not really, no, not really. But much more like America than any other Congress before it. Um, without question, it's a little older, and we know people are living longer than it used to be. There are 105 women, there are 53 African American members in the House, that's a record. There are 45 Latinx members, also a record. There are Native American, Asian American, Pacific Islander. In the Senate, there are 26 women, and one, two, three, four, five, six states have all female delegations, meaning both, both senators are women. And we have African-American senators, Latinx senators. Do, is it perfect? Does it look demographically like the country? No. As I said, is it better than ever before? Yes, it is. And when you think about where the democracy goes and what the effect in, in for good and for bad the Trump presidency has on the trajectory of democracy, remember that political parties are always behind social movements. Social movements propel the society forward and political parties try to catch up to get the majority of voters as those voters change their opinions. People are more free today in every aspect of their lives. It's true that economic mobility is a challenge. It's true there's income inequality. More people graduate from high school. More people actually go to college, even though not, not a majority of the country. People who love each other or are same-sex partners can marry constitutionally. Women can forge their families any way that they'd like. Men can forge their families any way that they can like. There's clearly racism, discrimination, there's a lot of, of the very ugly parts of our democracy. But at no time in our history has the country been more free and more participatory amongst a wider range of people, a more diverse group of people in its entire history. 
And we got here not because of politicians, you could argue, but frequently in spite of them. So when we think about getting out the door and still engaging and believing in the democracy, believe it. Because it will sustain, it will outlast, and it will survive and persist because if, if individuals who've always been the backbone of it continue to invest in it. And if I were thinking about one thing to think about going into 2020, it's that. Or you could think, this too shall pass, <laughs> one or the other. Okay, I'm gonna stop now and then I'll open up for questions. Thank you very much. Professor, uh, Jim Dresser. Um, back in the 60s when I was a government major at Wesleyan, because I guess we hadn't invented political science yet, um, I remember reading Richard Neustadt's Presidential Power and mm -hmm. his great concern about the uh, disproportionate growth in power of the executive branch. Uh, I want to get him alive again today and say, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, are you worried about that disproportionate changed even since the 60s, and do you have any suggestions of, if you are, what you might do about it, what we might do about it? So the, que the question, which is a, a really outstanding question, um, is a great question, is that the executive, uh, Richard Neustadt pr uh, presidential power, which I still assign in my presidency class, and is still on the graduate student comprehensive reading list, uh, so it's probably the most famous book written on the presidency, he basically, the argument is that the executive branch, uh, as I said, 120 years ago, the scope of the federal government wasn't very large. There wasn't a lot of money, there wasn't an income tax yet, but now the scope is, is so large that the combination of the expansion of the, particularly social welfare and entitlement programs at the federal level, which are uh, distribute funds or give you eligibility based on criteria. It takes some of the discretion that Congress used to have out of the equation when things are automated, when they're automatic. So your eligibility for food stamps, for example, or Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security and um, unemployment, all those kinds of things are calculated more than they are basically um, proscribed by Congress. So you take the rise of the social welfare state under FDR and then Johnson, and then you add foreign policy on top of that and an increasingly dangerous world, and you get 9-11, you, you, you get an expanded bureaucracy at the federal level. The executive branch has 4.1 million employees. That's the executive branch of government that does include active and non-active uh, and civilian military and the post office. But if you, if you exclude them, it's still 2.6 million bureaucrats for the federal government alone. That's impossible to track. And they have something called civil service tenure, which means it's hard to fire them. So that's an apparatus that is enormous, plus the national security apparatus, especially after 9-11, becomes so large that the president soaks up almost all the governmental space the executive branch. And Congress either, because it's not again, not in national security, can't fight the president effectively. They, can't, they don't enforce the War Powers Act, which used to put a limitation on the engagement of troops abroad without congressional approval. And because they can't really manage the budget and they're, they're polarized, they pass what we call continuing resolutions, which are mammoth spending bills either have a trillion or two trillion, three trillion dollars in them. It used to be you had 12 different appropriations bills. You had committees, you had hearings, you had markup. You, you did every single one of them on the floor of the House. That means all your constituents could see what you were voting to spend in these different areas. It's all gone. It's one big fat bill. And you know what happens if you don't pass the bill? The government shuts down. So they've created a self, again, a self-reinforcing phenomenon where they don't have to deal with the details anymore because they just threaten to shut the government down on each other. And so then the pressure is to pass the big bill. And I, I don't even know what's in that bill. Anybody ever see the movie Dave? Yeah. So Charles Grodin plays the accountant, who's a friend of Kevin Klein's, who's playing the president. And he brings him in because he wants to find $760 million for homeless people, to, so then Sigourney Weaver will like him. So reasonable. So he, Kevin, Charles Grodin looks at him and says, who does these books? How can you possibly know what's in here? And that's what the problem is. When Nancy Pelosi said the Obamacare bill was 2,000 pages and not everybody knew what was in it, 
She shouldn't have said that, but it was true. It's a, such an important thing. The founders would be spinning at warp speed, the Star Trek reference, warp speed, if they were here to see the size of the executive branch and the size of the government, because they understood that if you gave too much power to the executive branch, Jefferson creates the bureaucracy, you, you have no control over it. Nobody has control over it. And it's, it's very dangerous under a uh, president who plays by the rules. But imagine how dangerous it can be for a president who doesn't play by the rules. And that's where we have, you know, we have real, real difficulties. And that's where you look at what the Senate passed. They basically said to President Trump, you can't go to war with Iran without asking us. Yeah, like he's going to listen to them. What are they going to do to him? Nothing. So it's really, Madison would be phenomenally dismayed at the ceding of power to the executive branch. There's a, an author, a political scientist named Sid Milkus, and he's at the University of Virginia, and he's writing a whole book on this very thing. And, and now that Trump has shaped the Republican Party in his image, really, basically saying, if you're not with me, I'm gonna go out to your district and destroy you. Now you've got not only the institutional power, but you've got the partisan political power in the president as well. So it's awfully, awful lot of power. Thank you, Esther. I'll give you a suggestion. You won't like it. If members of Congress were elected for three years or four years, members of the House, they would be able to assert more power vis-a-vis -vis the executive. That two-year cycle is too short. Yes, I, uh, I feel ignorant, and I apologize for that because I think I should know the answer to my question. But it has it relates to the uh, Super Tuesday that we just experienced. Uh, of the five candidates, uh, three had uh, removed themselves uh, from the ballot and uh, had pledged a responsibility to one of the remaining two. Mm -hmm. But they all remained on the ballot and got a certain percentage of the votes. Uh, that appeared not in any way to affect uh, the total count for Biden at all. Uh, they had votes that were pledged, uh, but didn't uh, move in, in a positive way uh, to affect Biden's uh, total accumulated votes. And uh, I don't know what the value is of a, a resignation and an endorsement mm -hmm. if it does nothing. Uh, could you uh, put some well, light on this, please? Um, yes, yeah, so there's a couple things that happened there, and, and they will, you'll continue to see this phenomenon. Um, I'm also, while we're doing q and I'm gonna go to my last slide, which is, um, this is just depressing because it's so much money, but um, let me just show you, these are solutions. So while you're listening, while you're listening to the um, Q&A, you can look at my supposed solutions. So here's what happens. The problem, the, it's a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is that in primaries now, we have early voting and voting by mail in a lot of states. And it starts earlier, sometimes two weeks earlier than the date of the primary. And particularly for absentee ballots, that can be 30 days. So Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar got out on Saturday, Sunday and Monday, respectively. The problem was a lot of people had already cast their votes. That's why you saw those numbers as high as they are. They were already in. They'd already mailed them or deposited them. In fact, Washington State, and now they're having some difficulties with the virus, but they had 18 days of voting going up to next Tuesday. Many people cast their ballots before Super Tuesday. So you're probably gonna see uh, Bernie Sanders do pretty well in Washington State because people had already voted. They didn't think Joe Biden had a chance. And you're probably gonna see Buttigieg and Klobuchar get returns. So it's better to have more time to vote, more people vote that way. The problem is, and this is why people complain about early voting for the presidential election, you can vote with incomplete information. And that's what happened in a lot of those states. That's why you're seeing those delegates. Now, what happens to those delegates? States determine, you gotta love America and federalism, states determine by their own party rules. So the party in a particular state determines what happens to delegates from people who, resign, who, give, who don't run anymore, who get out of the race. So we won't know what happens to those delegates till the convention, you know, because they have choices. They can either go with somebody else, the, the, the person can uh, either pledge them to somebody else or they're free to vote for whoever they want. So there's this group of delegates that could decide, no, I just want to stay with Pete Buttigieg or I just want to stay with Amy Klobuchar. I'm not voting for anybody else. Or they're free agents and can do whatever they want. But it all depends on their state party rules. 
So there is a website that talks about that. It's called 270 to Win. It's a very good website. It'll keep track of party nomination rules. So you might want to try that. And Ballotpedia. Ballotpedia is also quite good on the rules as well. Any other questions? Thank you for your talk. Can you, you talked about how um, the plurality system, first past the post, kind of locks us into two parties. Can you give us some thoughts on ranked choice voting, whether that might help? And can you also talk about the possibility of expanding the size of the House of Representatives to overcome some of the issues with the Electoral College? Yeah, that's a, um, it's great. I don't think, yeah, I have length in, I have length in the House term, but I don't have expanding the House. So there's two, two questions. One is ranked choice voting. That's when on a ballot, you'll be given the opportunity not just to vote for one person from a particular district, but rank, rank order all the people running. So if there are three or four people running, you can say, I like one, two, three, four in that order. And that means you're gonna have to know about all four people if you really wanna make an educated voting guess. That can be difficult and onerous. It can actually produce more parties because if, if people can different parties can run and there's a chance they can win, then they'll get on the ballot, so it might open up the system. The problem is it's going to be rare for somebody who comes in three to ever win the seat. Somebody who comes in two can win the seat because if I have, you know, 40% of people put me first and 60% of people put me second, but then I'm number one on other people's lists, if I have more twos than ones, I can still win because it's really the person who has the, 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 the highest sentiment altogether. So it's complicated and it's unclear, you know, that it will really reflect the, the majority choice in a district. It won't, it will reflect sort of coalitions. It, I think it will require a lot of information on the part of voters and I'm not sure you're gonna get the most informed choices beyond one and two. So I don't know how it busts us out of partisanship, but we're gonna find out because more states are adopting it and there's a call for it in a lot of places. So it may be that people don't even rank. They just sow one, two, and then they walk out. Or they just do one, and they walk out. We won't know, I mean, Maine does it, but we, we won't, and a few other states do it. We won't know for a while whether it actually accomplishes the goal of increasing the number of parties that we can choose from. Expanding the size of the House. The, the size of the House of Representatives is limited by a law passed in, eight, in 1929 that caps the size of the House at 435. It's not a constitutional amendment, it's a law. It can be changed. The House can increase its own size. Right now, we have 711,000 people per district. After the next census, we'll probably have about 800,000, 820,000, give or take, per district. It's too many people to get to know. Madison said that members of the House should have a habitual recollection of their dependence on the people. You can't do that when you have 800,000 people to meet. So how do you communicate? Facebook, Twitter, political party messaging, your party label becomes much more important because then I can figure out what you're gonna do if I vote for you. So the bigger our districts get, the more entrenched parties get because there's no personal connection between you and the congressperson. Plus they only have two years, so they can't even travel the district enough to meet people. In a small state like Rhode Island, it's not so much of a problem, but in a larger state, you know, it's, it becomes a real problem for the nature of representation. They just don't represent their districts nearly the way that they used to, partially because the districts are too big. So adding more people, by the way, India has more people than we do, Russia, uh, Great Britain, all have much bigger legislators than we do. Great Britain doesn't have more people than we do. We could easily do it. I just don't know if there'd be the impetus to do it, but we could, then you'd cut that district size in half, let's say, you'd have 800 members of Congress. That's hard to organize, but you'd have probably better localized representation. The Senate's probably a bigger problem. California has 38 million people. Rhode Island has one million people, not even. And California has two senators, and Rhode Island has two senators. And there's a provision in the Constitution that says no senator, no state, no senator, I'm sorry, can ever vote to dilute the power of their state relative to any other state. So you have to change two provisions of the Constitution. You have to change that one, and then they can actually approve an amendment that would do proportional representation for the Senate. That may happen in our lifetime, but I wouldn't hold anybody's breath. <laughs> that last point, could you cite the section of the Constitution that's in? I've never heard that before. I'm not doubting you, I just wanna know. Is it, it's Article uh, 1, I presume. No, I, I don't know if it's Article 1. It could be in that miscellaneous section. 
section, Article 3. Oh, the old miscellaneous section. Yeah, you want to look while I'm answering <laughs> questions? That's um, okay. No, it's, uh, in, it's definitely in here because I remember thinking, oh, because I always suggest that we should change it, and then I realize that they can't actually vote. They're, they're bound um, uh, to do it. They can't, they can't change it. New states shall be admitted. Let's see. Um, dispose of making new for rules. I'll have to find it for you in email. But I'll it's come definitely up. here. I'll come or you can look it. at my constitution. Yeah. Okay, great. But it's here, yeah. So no state can vote to dilute its own power relative to any other state. Thank you for that. That's fascinating. That's part of the great compromise. <laughs> so up until 10 years ago, let's say, give or take, um, a politician, an elected official, or someone running for office, or a major media outlet could, ran the risk of lying um, in the fact that, you know, generally people could rise up and say that's absolutely false. Mm -hmm. Since then, uh, with uh, micro-targeting and social media, that's a lot harder to do. Um, mm -hmm. What on your slide deals with that? Uh, well, nothing on my slide deals with that. Um, I think, I think what we get wrapped up in is the communication about what the government is doing, whether it's investigating people or it's a policy implication um, or the, the wisdom of a particular policy, the impact of it. We get very wrapped up in the accuracy of that communication. And I think government has been keeping a lid on that kind of communication and manipulating that kind of communication for a very long time. There were just you know, not enough outlets that could do the investigation of that, right? So, you know, sometimes the government, you know, George W. Bush in an age of medium social media, but not that much, could say that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. You know, today, if the president said that, as, as he tried to do a little bit in the Iran situation, killing the general, there was an imminent attack. And then we find out maybe there wasn't an imminent attack. I think that's a function of time and technology. And it's, and we, our democracy, was built on elite people running the country with an, a basic acquiescence from people in the form of a vote that was limited to people who could read, write, and own property and who were white and who were male. You know, they never envisioned a participatory democracy where people who didn't have the capacity to sift through information would vote. Maybe they would extend the suffrage, but they didn't really see that. And, and, and our institutions, just the, like the size of the Congress, the number of years that members of the House serve, all of those things are not equipped to deal with the scope of interaction between the government and the people. Most of the time, 50 years ago, people wouldn't necessarily care. They weren't, the government didn't touch their lives the way the government touches their lives today. So we get very animated and agitated about every single thing we hear about the government because we see the government is so intertwined with our lives. And we don't, we don't know how to deal with that because it's relatively new. So, in terms of Facebook, political science is doing a lot of really interesting studies on the impact of ordering stories on Facebook, the algorithms of Twitter, when people like things, when they don't like things. You know, how much of this is manipulation? Well, Joe McCarthy, I would argue, did more damage with the Red Scare. In the very short period of time he did it, six years basically, six to seven years, than anything anybody's done today. You know, literally damage. People dying, people not having livelihood to work, and people discriminated against. Certainly Trump has had policies that hurt some parts of, these, of our society. But without the tools of social media and just playing on plain old fear, he managed to do that. I think this goes back again to, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Locke, you name it. People who looked at human nature. Humans are easily manipulated when they're scared. And it's just an echo chamber. It's not even an echo chamber. It's a sort of reverb, constant fear is constantly our motive right now. And I think, I think social media amplifies it, but I don't think social media created it. And I, but I do think our, our institutions are not built in any way, shape, or form to handle the size of the government or to handle the responsiveness that constituents are seeking now, and they want it now immediately. When I was working for Moynihan, we wrote letters back to constituents who wrote in about problems. And it took a week or two to get the answer. In Moynihan's office, it took a month or two. Um, or you called, or you went to a town meeting. You know, Madison would be solely distressed that there's no town meetings anymore. And now there's a coronavirus, so you have an excuse. But the Republicans started this 
no town meetings thing, Democrats kind of went along with it, there's very little way to find and see your congressperson and interact. And, and I think in the next 100 years, you know, 50 years, 20 years, we're gonna have to figure it out. We may be, that's why one of my slides said, is the, you know, is the country too big for Congress? You know, is this institution just outlived its usefulness in its structure? And I think it's a real question. I, I'm okay. not in charge of questions. <laughs> uh, in the back, yes, sir. I would like your insight on the notion of democratic backsliding and whether or not it's occurring in the United States. And if it is, is it a significant concern? You mean little d democratic democracies yeah, backsliding? Little d, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think there's some political scientists who've written uh, some pretty uh, famous books, uh, "How Democracy Dies," and you know, "Is Our Democracy Failing?" Um, and uh, yes, you're seeing all around the world. And this is another thing that we have to think about: How new are these democracies? You know, our democracy, as as pockmarked as it is with terrible stain, moral stains like slavery and civil war and, and civil rights movement and Jim Crow and lynching and all really terrible things, uh, we've survived. This structure has survived. But Europe basically started being democratic in 1946. That's not that long ago. So when you think about Russia, those of us who are old enough in the room to remember, Russia went democratic with Boris Yeltsin and then Medvedev. They weren't ready for it. They had lived under autocratic regimes for their entire existence. By the way, there's a really great um, Russian miniseries, Catherine the Great, in Russian. I highly recommend it, it's really good. But it really shows you some pretty scary stuff about how they ran their country. So when you think about that, most of the former Soviet Union got out from under the Soviet thumb they had been independent countries, but not even really in the turn of the century. So when did they experience democracy to its fullest? For about 25 years, since 1990. You know, it's new. And institutions take a long time. Again, Madison, Plato, whoever you want to cite, habituating people to the laws takes a long time. And the norms, you should respect other religions, other people's um, decisions, other people's political views. These are things that takes generation after generation. And the countries we're watching backsliding have only experienced that for a very short period of time. And before that, they hadn't experienced what we had either. They had either Tito in Yugoslavia for 30 years as a benevolent dictator. They only knew monarchy or dictatorship. They never knew democracy. So it's not surprising that the institutions there are not firm enough to withstand a charismatic populist leader like Orban in Hungary uh, among others, who's taking away some freedoms. What you are seeing that's hopeful is what I remember in 1981 in Poland on the Lech Walesa is a movement of people. They go and they protest, thousands and thousands of them. They march and they protest and they say, we're gonna risk our lives, but we're not gonna put up with this. So there's pushback among the younger generation. What the United States, in my opinion, should be doing is pushing back with them, is making sure we shore up those institutions. We don't have a president who's interested in doing that. And I think if you're worried about the future of the world, that should come into play for your election 2020 decision. Because it doesn't, it's not just about us. We have federalism, we have state government, state police, we have National Guard, which are federalized, but before they're federalized, they're, they're state-based. We have elections for state legislatures, states have sovereign powers. We have a bulwark against the federal government that wants to intrude, for left or for right. All those other countries don't really have that. So I think it's important to think about that moving forward. I think it's a really big concern in the next four to eight years, whether we reinforce democratic tendencies or we, or we don't do anything about it. And I think it'll be, it'll be more dangerous. But Europe's sort of reverting back to Europe. And it was a period of golden life in history that they weren't what they've been. It's gonna take a lot more work over the next 20 to 40 years to really cement those traditions, to those norms, democratic norms. Okay, I think we have uh, time for just one more quick there's question. One, there's one gentleman here who's been raising his hand, I don't know, in the back. Okay, so we'll make it quick. I just wanted to have you just um, explain the third one, if I don't. Understand what oh, that is. divide. Okay, divide, divide the Senate into two electoral classes rather than three. So, as you may know, no more than typically, no more than 34, maximum 36 senators are ever up for re-election in a given electoral cycle. 
So that means the majority of senators are never up for re-election at the same time. The House, everybody's up for re-election, everybody in the House. But the Senate, there's no majority that ever worries. Two-thirds of the Senate essentially don't worry about anything in an election year because they're not up yet. What that does is reduce their incentive to cooperate. It reduces their incentive to produce legislation. It reduces their incentive to respond to the House. Now, if you want government to do more and pass things, you want to change that. If you don't want government to pass things, you want to keep it as it is. But if we do two classes, then it's at least 50-50. Then every two years, somebody, you know, every two or four years, somebody, the same, it may be that there's one cycle that they're not all up, but then in the other two cycles, 50% would be up. And that would push people to getting things done, and you wouldn't have as much obstruction, and you'd have more responsiveness. Again, that's also um, in the Constitution, so it'd be hard to change. But, uh, but oh no, yeah, it is actually. So I think, uh, but it's really something to think about. Remember that. The Senate has no incentive as a collective institution to do anything in a given election year. And this year, Republicans are defending 23 seats the Democrats are defending 12. So I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but look for the, those contests to be um, very, very, very tightly fought across the country in 2020. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we can't.